It is Saturday, uh, March 5th, and welcome to another edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Richard Riccardi, the last time we had you on, you, we were calling you nurse, but now you have become a doctor. Congratulations and welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear me? Of course I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can see you. Can you hear me? <laughs> you know, Hello? so much has changed um, over the last week or so. Just about everywhere around the United States are beginning to lift their vaccine mandates, their mask mandates, and the country appears to be returning to normal. Um, but there is caution, there's a caution when in the air because there are still people who are contracting the COVID-19 virus and people are still in the hospital and people are still dying. And while all of us, I think in many ways, celebrate certain aspects of lifting the mandates, there are many people who felt that the, after the vaccine, the mask uh, was the second line of protection for everyday citizen. And there are vulnerable citizens in our society who feel even more vulnerable at the latest actions by states across the country. I don't know if you watched the State of the Union on Tuesday night, but what was so apparent was that it was a maskless um, uh, event. The president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, I don't think there was any member of Congress who had on a mask. That clearly sent the message that the country was returning to normalcy. You know, what's amazing is um, when I saw the footage of, of the president walking in, you could not help but notice they're sending a message that America is getting back to the economy. I don't know whether so much of the science uh, are just the other data that people examine and look into. Uh, maybe uh, it's an election year. It's a midterm election. But we invited um, Dr. Richard Riccardi um, to join us, along with um, Assemblyman Clive Vanell in New York, to talk about um, this issue. You know, uh, Dr. Riccardi, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, I'm sure It's great to be with you. Why is it that disabled and immunocompromised people yeah. fear lifting the mask mandates will leave them vulnerable? Well, it's very important that we pay attention to our fellow citizens, our friends, our family members, people in our community, because there are individuals that have a weakened immune system. And they are at much greater risk for getting serious illness and perhaps death from contracting all, you know, infectious diseases. And right on the front lines right now is COVID. But it's not just specific to COVID. It's to many of the perhaps even everyday diseases that we will have an intact immune system or a strong immune system will fight off and go on with their lives. These individuals, because they may be recovering from cancer or have genetic autoimmune disorders, uh, put them at a weakened state so their body is not as capable to fight off infection. So yes, Armstrong, I agree with you. We do need to be concerned, but importantly, these individuals have to have a stronger uh, itinerary of defense, meaning they need to wear masks, be cautious where they go, pay attention to who is vaccinated, who's not vaccinated, et cetera. Well, so let's um, turn by time to four years ago. Many people still had these issues before there was COVID and the pandemic, and they were not wearing masks. Why would it be any different from them now? Are you saying? that COVID has further weakened their immune system? 
No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that COVID has placed a heightened awareness to indiv- to the individuals uh, because of the um, you know the uh, intensity of COVID, how COVID, how much it's in the population, how long it's staying around, and our inability to develop what's where we're moving to now what we hope we're moving to now, which is a herd immunity. So individuals, let's say, for example, an individual that isn't necessarily concerned about getting measles, mumps, or rubella because the majority of the population is immunized, there's herd immunity, so those particular viruses are not around for them to contract. Assemblyman um, Vanell, thank you for joining us. New York City lift this vaccination mandate for businesses, for events, mask rules for city schools have been lifted. Uh, you are a legislature. Are, were you in favor of the lifting of these mandates? What are the pros and cons for, from for where you sit and in terms of what your constituency reflect upon you? First of all, also, thank you for having me. There actually are no cons. We have lifted our uh, mandate First of all, for uh, public business, almost a month in February. And right now, actually, yesterday, our governor announced the lifting of masks, the mask mandate for schools, for all schools across the state, and the uh, city and municipalities will be able to make that determination based on their numbers. What's happening in New York State is that the vaccination numbers are high. Uh, many people who are one of the highest vaccinated. Uh, states across the country, um, and and the numbers have gone down. So at this point, the uh, infectious rate that uh, across the state is down 98% since before the Omicron virus came here. So we're really excited about what we're seeing uh, in, in in our state, and we're really excited that New Yorkers are you know are doing what they had to do to make sure that we're staying safe. And it's great news that, to see that this is happening before you know before the springtime. People are excited. People want to get back to 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 uh, to a new sense of normalcy. Uh, and, we're, and, and we're excited about it, Armstrong. So, Richard, is this happening based on the science, the data, the fact that uh, the death rate has dropped drastically, far less people are in the hospital, or is it based on politics? Uh, well, I, I believe... I'm strong that this is based primarily on science. We've been working at this for a number of years now. Primarily the first line of defense was vaccination. And we, we have approximately 76% of the United States with vaccinated with at least one vaccine and 65% of the population are what we consider fully vaccinated. And on top of that, estimates, and these are really big estimates, approximately 25 to 30% of the entire U.S. population has had COVID. So combining the vaccinated group with the individuals who have naturally acquired immunity from getting COVID, we have established a high degree of uh, immune res- of, of capability in individuals to develop an immune response, which protects the entire population. So the science is evolving. It started with the development of the vaccine and the, 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 the traditional risk mitigation strategy about washing your hands, don't touching your don't touch your face, and maintaining distances. Now we've moved to a new level where we have a good majority of the population have some degree of immunity against the virus. So that allows us to be um, capable of, of opening doors where we can now take greater normal lifetime uh, activities like we were used to before COVID. So are you saying quickly that the harshest, harshness of this virus is over? I believe that we will keep an eye on whether the virus mutates and it decides to 
uh, be more aggressive in the way that it, it, it can break through our defenses. But yes, under the current, what we're seeing is the great number of reductions in individuals getting COVID, just like he was talking about in New York, and also the death rate going down, hospitalizations going down significantly. And let's hope that that continues. Assemblyman uh, Vanell, your final thoughts? I'm sorry, sir. We're really excited. The doctor said we're really excited that that you know infectious rates are going down, hospitalizations going down, and you know just like anyone else, people want to get back to uh, sex and normalcy. Thank you. Um, thank you for having this topic. Thank you for having this topic. Well, something that we're all concerned about across the country. That we're doing. Assemblyman Vanell, Dr. Riccardi, uh, thank you for joining us. We'll be back Thank to you, turn our Armstrong. attention to re Ukraine and Russia. One, two, three, four, Charles Fattis is a retired head of the CIA for Weapons of Mass Destruction Terrorism Unit, and he joins us. You know, some have said that um, America is, the CIA doesn't have the capacity or the technology or the intel to protect the United States, um, and yet you guys are find yourselves all over the country, many people say, at a weakened state. Um, what, what is it that, and I know we're gonna talk about Ukraine, is it, where do you, where do you think the CIA um, uh, needs to be involved in helping the United States, especially with what's going on in, in Europe right now with the Ukrainians and the Russians? Right, well, what the CIA can do is tell you what's going on inside somebody's head if they're doing the job right. You can look at a satellite, and see that Vladimir Putin has lined up 200,000 guys on the border with Ukraine, tanks, missiles, and artillery. What the CIA can tell you, if they're doing it right, that nobody else can, is, is that a bluff? Is it not? What's his real intention? But that requires a human source and nobody can do it. Is Putin bluffing about his nuclear armament? Uh, well, uh, yeah, largely. I mean, uh, in my estimation, what the guy thought he was going to do was run into Ukraine, wrap this thing up in about 72 hours, install a puppet government, and move on. 
didn't turn out that way, he's bogged down and the sanctions and other measures are hurting. And so what he wants to do is scare people and get them to back off. I mean, a nuclear war is, he's already run his country into the ditch or a nuclear war isn't gonna help. Um, where did he miscalculate? Well, I think he probably, look, this is a guy who considers his fall of the Soviet Union, in his own words, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, right? He's he's still living in the past in terms of what the Soviet Union was. The reality is that Russia is a greatly diminished power with greatly diminished capacity, and the Ukrainians are no slouches. They were a part of the Soviet Union themselves. So he thought they were gonna fall over and, and quit, and they didn't. And probably, you know, in, like in any dictatorship, the people around him probably are inclined to tell Putin what he wants to hear not give him the uncomfortable reality of what's going to really happen when he pushes the button. What role are the oligarchs playing in all this, it's especially now they don't have access to their wealth and their fantasy lifestyle, and the reality is setting in unless they change this trajectory? Well, there, that, that, you know, that's, that remains to be seen. We, we can hope that what's going to happen here is that while Putin may want to continue to live in his fantasy world, that there are going to be folks around him who are going to say, I'm not riding this thing to the ground with you. We, we will see. You know, it takes a long time for that kind of stuff to develop, and sometimes folks don't stand up and do the right thing. Could the United States and her European allies could have stopped this in its track and the invasion would have never happened? Yeah, I mean, let, let's start with this, right? The Russian economy basically revolves around oil and natural gas sales. Something like 40% of their budget comes from oil and natural gas sales. Without that money, Putin can't run a war, can't fund his own military. Uh, Joe Biden could have not shut off. I mean, Joe Biden has essentially waged jihad on the American oil and natural gas industry since he came in, right? He could have gone in the other direction, ramped up production, cut into Russian sales, taking away the money Putin needed to do this. He could have also said to Putin, because Putin certainly has a valid concern about Ukraine for joining NATO, while he increased the pain level for Putin, he could have also said, look, if you need assurances that NATO is not expanding to Ukraine, then we can talk about that, sort of a carrot and stick approach, give the guy an off ramp, and we would probably never be where we are today. You know, we see these images um, of Ukrainian law enforcement forcing people off the train. You see these images that they're Africans and they're black, and it could be a part of the propaganda where they're trying to play the race card. They have less sympathy for the Ukrainians. Uh, it could be that if you don't, if you're not native and they recognize that you're not, you don't get the first seat on the train. Talk about the propaganda campaign and talk about those images. Well, the images are obviously disturbing, and I think it's entirely possible that there are cases of individuals that are taking folks that are, for instance, black Africans that are in Ukraine trying to go into Western Europe and telling them you're not welcome. That's that's hardly beyond beyond belief, right, that we would find folks who are still exhibiting prejudice and acting in, in that fashion. On the other hand, the propaganda war is intense here. Both sides, the Ukrainians and the Russians, are are to some extent making things up. I mean, the Ukrainians uh, effectively manufactured this fictitious fighter race they claim is patrolling the skies over Kiev and shooting down Russian planes, which is silly. And and uh, the Russians are calling the Ukrainians Nazis. And, the, you know, I mean, everybody's going to look for, for some way to demonize the other side. And we all have to be careful and kind of cut through that and get to reality. We think we know much about Putin, but what is it that we need to know about Zelensky? Well, I, I mean, I guess what we need to know about Zelensky and about Ukraine writ large is that while we can have sympathy for the Ukrainian people and while we can have certainly want to restrain Russian aggression, we don't need the Soviet Union reconstituted. That's not in our interest. Let's resist the temptation to paint the Ukrainian government as sort of you know, pure as the driven snow kind of thing. I mean, Ukraine has its own issues with corruption and lack of a true democratic process. So let's 
I think the challenge in anything that deals with national security and war is to just stay clear eyed, right? It's to stay rational, to keep the emotion out of it. Let's just focus on what is really happening here. What about Germany? Germany is the real power in Europe. The money to spend 2% on defending itself, not talking about increasing it after what has happened in Ukraine. What is, the, what is their whole card? What, uh, we don't really know which side they're on. It seems as though they're playing it up the middle. What is their true agenda, and why is it that they can make a difference in this conflict? Well, they're an incredibly powerful nation, I mean, it, it, at least economically, right? But let's face it, what are the Germans doing? The Germans are doing at any one point in time what they perceive is good for Germany, and frankly, that's making money and posting the economy. And that really goes for all of Europe, right? I mean, Americans are always waiting for the day when the Europeans are going to lead. Why do we always have to be the ones leading? You know, I get news for you that, well, you can wait in vain for that day. It is always going to be the case. When Yugoslavia was going up in flames and genocide was being committed on the doorstep of Western Europe, it still took the United States of America to take point to, to bring that to an end. That left to them to their own devices. The Europeans would have just watched it happen. China, the elephant in the room. China, yeah, so the Chinese are lashed up with the Russians, right? They just basically signed what amounts to an alliance with them. They're buying all of their oil that they can get their hands on to ensure that Putin's got money. Uh, it's funny how we don't talk about China at all. Biden will trash the Russians all day long, but the Chinese, who are a much greater threat, kind of just get a pass. I, I'm tempted to say that that has something to do with the fact that over the years, Joe and his son have taken literally billions of dollars in Chinese money. So it'll, it'll, be, a, it'll be a cold day in hell before Joe Biden stands up to the Chinese because they own him. Like, explain that. Now, you've got to explain that. You know, you hear that. Nobody wants to talk about it because he's the president of the United States. You believe... The Russians, the Chinese, own President Biden. And you're the former head of the CIA's terrorism division of weapons of mass destruction. Why do you say that? Yeah, well, I mean, so let's just, you know, to, to draw out that backdrop, I, I spent a, a big chunk of my life in the business of running sources, recruiting sources, and, and hunting other people's sources. So I kind of know the business. The Chinese have a practice they call elite capture. It's not a fantasy. It's not a conspiracy theory. It is a major worldwide program. And that program is to co-opt, to buy, to control the elite, the powerful people in target countries. At the top of that list, not surprisingly, is the United States. They do this all day long. Now, take that template, look at what they do and exactly how they do it, which we know, have the whole. And then look at Joe Biden and his and the amount of money that has been funneled to him. Right on one trip in 2013 alone, he and Hunter went over. He, Joe goes off to meetings with Chinese leadership. Hunter goes to a meet with the State Bank of China, and they give him what later turns out to be $1.5 billion. And then they both climb back on Air Force Two and fly back to the United States. Well, you know, that is kind of exactly what it looks like it is, right? And what do you get for that? You get a guy who's now sitting in the White House who you bought a long time ago. I think this is a key element of what people don't don't yet face with Joe. You are not just looking at incompetence. How, right? do, you, how, how, how do you get that kind of money in the United States? How do you get it in banks? How does that work? One point, some billion dollars? It was a direct, I mean, it was all done above board in that sense. It came straight from the State Bank of China and it went into bank accounts in the United States. And nobody has ever disputed it. Biden hasn't ever disputed that and disputed most of the other transactions that involved millions and millions and millions of dollars. He just claims that somehow or another it had nothing to do with him. So his son, who gets thrown out of the Navy for, for you know, cocaine use, who has no discernible skills, uh, somehow people feel compelled to hand this guy billions of dollars who, who can't produce anything other than access to dad. But we're not supposed to ask about it. We're just supposed to pretend like we can't see it. 
We're going to continue this conversation, and Sheriff A.J. Lauterbach is also going to join us to talk about our porous borders. I'm Armstrong Williams. It's Saturday, March 5th, and don't go away. Five, four, three, two, one. And welcome back. And I see we have Sheriff Lauder back. We'll get to him shortly. I want to welcome him. So let me come back to you, um, Charles. What influence does NATO, United Nations, they have in this process? Are they owned by the Chinese? Do they have any real power? Well, they, they, they do have power. And, and look, let's not, let's not kid ourselves about what these sanctions are doing. The Russians... The Russian economy is not particularly strong to start with, and these sanctions are crushing. The ruble is essentially worthless. So, if these if they hold the line on this, that this this can actually be powerful. That's obviously the caveat, right? Like putting sanctions in place for a few days or a week is one thing. They have a tendency, most of these countries, to drift away and within weeks or months begin to lift the sanctions. So resolution is crucial. So, if Putin is back into a corner, you don't think under any conditions, nuclear options would be his go-to? And listen, they're saying he's a madman. We've not seen him like this before. He seems to be unstable. Is this propaganda, or what do you think the truth is about Putin's stability? I don't think he's unstable. Is he delusional to a certain extent? It, it, I started off by saying that he thought he was going to win this thing in 72 hours, and that didn't happen. So, yeah, on some level, he's delusional. He's a pragmatic guy, as most most Russians are, in my experience. Is there danger of nuclear war? Well, there's danger of a wider conflict, for sure, because wars start without anybody intending. He can stumble into conflict. So, you know... While we pressure this guy, I think what we also want to do is look for a way to allow him to find an off-ramp to get out of this crisis. We don't want this confrontation to go on forever. Talking about not going on forever, are there any similarities with World War I and others where this could lead to a World War III? Because that is a concern that people, many people around the world that they have. Yeah, look, without question, right? World War I started because... A, a, a guy who was the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire gets assassinated in Serbia. And the next thing you know, you got a war that I think killed 25 million people and involves 
every great European power. Nobody sat down and said, hey, here's my plan. I think we should fight this war and get a whole bunch of people killed. It got out of control really fast. And conflicts do that. So we we need to manage this. Again, I keep always come back to this. When you're talking about force and national security, it is no time for emotion, boasts, chest thumping, all of this nonsense. You got to get really clear eyed, very sober, very rational and be very careful. Before I go to Sheriff Lauder, what is it that the mainstream media, the European media, um, the Russian media, what is it that they actually get wrong? What is it that we're not seeing that's being underreported in, uh, in this crisis? Well, I think what, what what everybody wants to do is they want to paint one side. You know, they want to paint this in a typical way. Yeah, one side is the good guys. One side is the bad guys. It's all or nothing. Either the Russians are good, the Ukrainians are good. It's a lot more complicated than nuance. I mean, Putin is a thug. He wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union. But the threat of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO, sitting on his border, and the possibility of American tank divisions being that close to his capital, Putin, any other leader in Russia, will regard that as a threat. We should have defused that years ago because it was always going to be something the Russians would not allow. Sheriff Lodabai, how porous are our borders? Well, increasingly so, because as we as we uh, contemplate and talk about the uh, the issue in in uh, Ukraine, we've had uh, we've had weapons pointed at us every day uh, from the cartels. As our border uh, still continues to be, um, uh, you know, the vision of an open border is here. It's in the United States. It's promoted by this by this administration, and uh, it's still causing the, the devastation and chaos um, uh, every day. You know, um, Charles, is there anything that we can do about our borders? And do you think we're as vulnerable as many on the conservative side are saying we are if we don't do something about our borders and who are, who's coming in? Well, Armstrong, yeah, we can... we're being invaded. We have a national invasion here today, and I think it's every bit as bad as, as what uh, uh, as what people are saying. From, just from a law enforcement perspective on the empowerment and the rise of the cartel, the sophistication of the cartel, uh, as, as they every day uh, become more and more, um, uh, the, their abilities are, are really the American public does not understand what we're up against here with the uh, with the current cartels. And in my area, it's Cartel de Golfo, but you've got the uh, Cartel Jalisco, Nuevo Generacion, that is uh, very militaristic. Uh, it is it is overtaking. Uh, uh, property in different uh, areas of, of South Texas and, uh, and uh, Southern Mexico. You still have the Sinaloa that's dominant in the northern part of Mexico, which works the uh, Arizona border heavily. And uh, the the entire situation is is bleak as far as the uh, control over our, our southern border. Uh, and in Texas law enforcement, as we just continue to be um, you know, pummeled by the by the uh, uh, massively funded cartel operation. Charles, what does your human intelligence share with you about the southern and other borders in this country? Well, here, here I think is is a central fact that folks need to understand. We refer to cartels, and that term gets thrown out as kind of a synonym for a gang. And we understand we got armed and they're dangerous and they do horrible things. Cartel is not a synonym for a gang. You're not talking about X number of guys with guns who do bad things. What you're talking about are criminal organizations that effectively supplant the existing civil government. So the easiest way to think about this is that increasingly we do not share a border with the country of Mexico. Increasingly we share a border with a narco state or actually multiple narco states. So it is not just that there are guys with guns who do bad things and move drugs on the other side of the border. It is that they control all of the institutions 
of government. So you have a terrorist narco state, multiple actually, and we're effectively opening our border to that. So you're getting immigrants or illegals coming across the border, vast quantities of drugs, including fentanyl, which is killing people in American cities at an unprecedented rate. And, and then by the way, anything else on earth that is evil can cross that border. Weapons of mass destruction, terrorist groups, we have we've we have ceded control of that's a the reality. That's a direct threat to American national security. Sheriff sure, back your response? Well, it's very accurate. You're running the especially let's just take the uh, cartel Jalisco Nuevo Generacion, which is a parallel uh, to the Mexican government. You're talking about a militaristic force with uh, with heavy weapons, uh, armored vehicles. Uh, Kevlar helmets, uh, com- completely can't tell the difference between CJNG uh, troops as they come out of armored vehicles that they're uh, completely in uniform and matching uniforms and matching equipment. Uh, this is this is a, a new threat level here in Mexico as these folks are able to, uh, this cartel alone is able to take on the Mexican government and in, in, in possibly win so a narco country. Uh, narco states, obviously. I'm right across from Tamaulipas uh, in Mexico. Uh, and really, the with with the, the president of Mexico's policies that are in place right now, the states aren't receiving any help at all. So you're you're looking at state forces that are that are fighting the cartel without the assistance uh, from the Mexican government. In many cases, this is uh, this is the hugs, not bullets situation that. Um, uh, President of Mexico, AMLO, has put together, and uh, that's what's happening to the country there as they are declining and, and, and losing to the cartel on a daily basis. This is a real threat to the United States. It's a real threat, a very real threat to Texas. You know, finally, um, and I'm going to call you Sam, finally, what needs to happen? I know you talked about the sanctions. We have a panelist coming up to talk about the SWIFT. Uh, what is necessary to stop Putin's aggression to bring this regional war to a complete halt? Well, on, on top of everything that's already ongoing, I would say the single biggest thing the Biden administration could do is reverse course completely on its policy toward oil and natural gas. We ought to be doing everything possible to stop the Russians from selling oil. By the way, we're still buying it. And then we ought to be ramping up our production, telling the Western Europeans, we'll fill every liquid natural gas carrier you have. We will supply all of the heating and energy and cut off that that flow of cash into the Russian economy. Without that, they can't, can't live. Literally 40% of their federal budget comes from that revenue. You cut that off, he can't even put gas in his tanks. You know, um, Sam Faddis, you're going to be back with us on Monday night with your voice and your future. Sheriff Lauder back. You're going to be back with us on Monday night with your voice, your future, as we continue these conversations. Thank you both for joining us. Logan Delaney and Josh Bernard is coming up next to discuss SWIFT. Don't go away. One, two, three, four, five.
Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Logan Delaney, which country owns SWIFT and why is it being used? Uh, owned by any one country. It's, it's a conglomeration and an association of financial institutions uh, in a number of companies, uh, in a number of countries. I believe there are, uh, are 11,000 banks and financial institutions that are associated with SWIFT. So it's, it's like a... a, a an organization and the members are its users. Why is it being used? It's being used uh, as, as part of the uh, sanctions because it's a very convenient way of transferring funds uh, electronically from one place or, or one institution to another institution in a foreign country. And it's used for uh, financial transactions between countries. It's very similar to a wire transfer that's done domestically or an ACH. Josh, will it be effective? Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't think so. I think there was a time that it would be. I, I think it's going to hurt a little bit. Um, you know, but I don't think it'll be as effective as it once would have been. I think there are a number of ways around it. Um, the SIPs, which is the Chinese Yuan version of SWIFT or IBAN. Uh, you know, it's interesting to see that Putin, right as this thing kicked off, meets with the Chinese leadership. I believe, I'm guessing here, but I believe that it had something to do with being able to move that money. And ultimately, as long as you can settle your energy or natural gas and oil trades, um, you know, you, you still have the revenue. It's, it's a huge revenue source for them. And as long as they can get that revenue, I don't know how much really they need to be transferring across um, borders, at least for five, six, seven, eight months. You know, they've got the reserves. So, no, I don't think it will be. What would have been effective to that would have impacted Russia financially, Josh? You know, um, I don't know, other than all out war, which I think would be idiotic. I, I think that we financially have the means to hurt them the, the way we once did. I mean, dollar, dollar hegemony is really the purpose of this war. I, I believe wholeheartedly that the global banking cartel is working with, and Putin is working with them as well, um, cut off the energy supply to Europe, drive them to LNG, which, um, allows those trades and their energy to settle in U.S. dollars as opposed to the euro, the ruble, yuan. And so over this last couple of years, we've printed so much money, dollar hegemony has started to fall apart. Dollar demand isn't there anymore. And so controlling the world through the issuance of currency has started to fail. Um, and I think in order to get demand back into the Federal Reserve note, the Federal Reserve and all those thousands of banks involved in it and the SWIFT system that uh, or just mentioned, need to have a bid for the dollar. And generally, since 1971, that's been hydrocarbons, crude oil, and, and gas. Logan, your response? I tend to agree with Josh that uh, SWIFT is an inconvenience, but it's not a, a great impediment to uh, the Russians. And if you want to have a great impediment, you have to look at where the, uh, the dollar flows are. And the dollar flows uh, happen to be in energy. Uh, a very large portion of Russia's uh, foreign exchange is based on energy. Um, last I looked, they're getting something like half a uh, 500 
million dollars a day in revenues from gas and oil. Uh, that's a lot of a lot of revenues. And if you want to cut the uh, and, and and have an impact and and, and cut off that uh, supply of of exports uh, export revenues uh, to the Russians, you have to figure out a way of supplying energy to the rest of the world, specifically Europe, uh, specifically um, uh, liquid natural gas uh, to Europe, uh, so that they can basically cut their umbilical cord to the Russians. Right now, the Russians have Europe over uh, a barrel when it comes to energy. And uh, it's gotten worse because you know the Germans used to have 30% of their energy coming out of uh, nuclear facilities. And a few years ago, uh, they basically said uh, they were shutting down all those facilities. Now that's 30% of your energy, and they were replacing it with natural gas coming from Russia. Uh, if you look at uh, the Ukraine right now, and you look at where the pipelines are, Ukraine has a lot of pipelines going through it with uh, Russian gas uh, going to the West. It's going to Italy, it's going to, uh, you know, all kinds, all other, a lot of other places in, in Europe as well. So it, it, I think the only effective sanction right now is to figure out how to cut uh, Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas so we're not uh, supplying them with uh, $500 million a day in cash. So Josh, how big is Russia's default risk? And uh, is it being over-exaggerated? Um, the ruble is collapsing. They shut down their stock market this week. Uh, and um, Russia could hit a depression. What is the real story on Russia as it goes through um, fighting this war and the economics of it for its country? Yeah, you know, I wish I could say that I had the, the real full story, but I do believe much of that is propaganda, at least at this juncture. Uh, I think we've seen a ton of propaganda and things that don't quite square uh, about motives. I think that, um, you know, Ukraine, if it was just, just Russian gas crossing the overland pipelines through the Ukraine uh, and, and into Europe, then why would Putin actually physically enter the country, right? But the reality is there's even more pipelines running from Turkey, you know, Armenia, the Persian Caucasus over land there that also needed to be cut off. And I believe this is just propaganda about they're going into Kiev and all this stuff. I don't think so at all. I think this is about cutting that energy off, driving Europe to liquid natural gas, which will make all natural gas prices and hydrocarbon prices globally go through the roof. Meanwhile, Russia has found other other bids, other buyers. They're exporting all over the world. And I agree 100% that, um, you know, that until you can stop that, there's not really a sanction that's, that's going to matter because this is a relatively low cost incursion for Putin and the, and the oligarchs. Um, and I think that there are some other things at play here. We've expanded NATO even since the fall in, you know, in, in 91, you would think NATO would have started to shrink or go away because its opponent was gone, right? But it didn't. It continued to develop countries and move closer and closer to Russia. We've had this argument with Putin for a very long time. Um, and then you throw on top of it all of the corruption and, and the stuff, you know, with the Clinton Foundation and various other entities that have been using Ukraine as a, a legal cash cow, you know, and money laundering uh, organization for a long time, you know, putting their kids on boards and just stripping cash out of there. And I think, you know, Putin has a lot of motivation that people aren't talking about um, to defend their sovereignty over there. And I'm not taking his side. He's not a good guy. I'm not saying that, but it makes sense. And, and Logan, why is it that we don't talk enough about Turkey and these other Arab countries and the role that they play? It's always the United States, it's always Europe. But yet, there's some bigger players on the stage in this conflict. Well, uh, Turkeys would take offense if you called them Arabs. Okay? I, I, I said other Arab states. I was. Uh, not, uh, I just said other. You mean Arab countries in addition? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that is one of the missing elements is that the Saudis, for example, have 
basically stepped aside on this issue. If we had a really good relationship with Assad, you would think that uh, there would be discussions right now between the U.S. and the Saudis and other uh, countries uh, in, the, in the Middle East, but it's specifically the Saudis, to uh, make up the difference in oil and, and, and gas. Uh, and, and those conversations are not occurring, and I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I think, you know, you know, one of the things is that Russia uh, was, and I think still is, a member of OPEC, or, or a functional member, if not an actual member. And, uh, uh, you know, they're looking out for their eventual best interests, which is to keep the, the price of hydrocarbons and, and oil and gas in particular uh, high. And this is particularly true when you consider that, you know, if you look at the future, uh, the West and most of the rest of the world is trying to figure out how to eliminate hydrocarbons, uh, you know, from the energy mix. And I suspect that at this point, uh, you know, it, that will that drive will go into overdrive because people realize uh, and governments realize that there's a certain dependence on the part of the world that you really don't want to be dependent on. You know, it's fascinating because uh, uh, what has been of little note is that when the UK issued its sanctions against Russia and the SWIFT, they excluded seven Russian banks from that. Um, and, you know, what is, you know, sometimes you just don't know what to believe. There's so much that's propaganda that's out there. But one thing that is obvious from this conversation, Josh, is that America is really sitting on the sidelines with little leverage in this process. Well, I think, you know, America generally does, no matter what the social constructs are, what the Federal Reserve Bank, the banking cartel wants. And I think I know why Saudi is sitting on the sidelines because they're our partner in the petrodollar compact. They're the reason that all crude oil for so many years and, and, and hydrocarbons have settled to the Federal Reserve note is because in 1971, we defaulted. We ran out of money because of Vietnam and guns and butter. And we went to them and we said, well, I'll offer you ultimate military protection for all time as long as you only take the Federal Reserve note, this new currency we're going to issue um, for settlement. And so they have the exact same motive that Putin and that the Federal Reserve Bank does. So the idea that Biden or anyone else is going to overturn what our currency issuer and our dark overlords at the Fed want, uh, it's not going to happen. You know, they're, they're all on the same team. And But not by, this is just by default, the currency that stands to benefit the most from this regional war is the almighty dollar. Right. 100%. It's going to, the bid is going to come in. There will be demand for dollars, and that'll bail us out of the $6.8 trillion we just printed. It will shift all of that debt globally instead of just on us. And, you know, as long as that dollar hegemony holds up, that's the concept. And, 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 and Logan, this is the sad part about this conversation is that war stimulates and resurrects economies. Well, you know, that has often happened that you can stimulate your economy by starting a war. It's not a productive way to stimulate your economy, uh, but you know it's it's one of the you know the facts that you know war has been with us ever since humanity and civilization started. Uh, I suspect that war will continue to be with us, and the issue of how you finance wars uh, has you know it's it's always been at least based on my knowledge of history, wars have always been financed by borrowing. Rarely are they financed purely by raising taxes on people, because if they did, you probably wouldn't have as many wars uh, going on. Uh, and I, I agree with Josh that right now, the United States has uh, uh, printed a whole lot of dollars. There's a lot of inflation on the horizon, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be shocked if we would see anything less than 10% uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, and, you know, one of the things about this conflict is that it provides a little bit of air cover 
to the Fed uh, and the Biden administration on inflation. Inflation would be a much more difficult uh, issue for the current administration and the Fed, uh, and they'd have to be much more aggressive in fighting it, but for this uh, war. You know, I, I, I got to tell you, we've done many shows on, on the economy uh, and how the money chain works. And I, I just must tell you, you guys were really excellent on this topic, Josh and Logan and Sam Faddis, before you talking about what's really going on in Ukraine. Because, you know, people don't realize they're fed such propaganda. They're really out of the loop of what really goes on in the world. And it's really, really exciting. And they want them to be out of touch and out of the loop. Uh, I cannot thank you both and all our guests today for joining us for this Saturday, uh, March 5th edition of the Armstrong Women Show. WGLA 24-7, Aideen and Aaron and Kevin, uh, Mason and my man Greg Masani. Thank you for all that you do to make this show and make me look pretty decent. Thank you for joining us. Do your homework, guys. Read.